Thanks much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Everyone, welcome to the Neural Networks talk. Uh, thank you for coming tonight to listen to this. If you have been to some of the previous talks, then some of this information will feel a little bit familiar. It'll be coming back. And uh, I'll just be briefly introducing it to get it fresh into your mind again. Uh, so first, I want you to listen to these two songs and tell me which one you think was made by AI and which one do you think was made by a human. So that was the first audio clip. Oh yeah. And right, here's the second, here's the audio second clip. one. We'll skip a little bit ahead, I think. Alright, we're gonna Yeah, that one started a little bit in, so I'm gonna skip ahead. See. So given those two audio clips, which one do you think was which? Can you play the first one again? Play the first one again? <laughs> well, oh yeah, I'll play it for a little bit, yeah. Short little sound bit. So this is the first one. This one's made by AI. Right, you think that one? I'm going to say both are AI. Yeah. We got both, both are AI. AI. Okay. Both are, yeah. Did I say hands up? I, both are I, AI? I feel like I heard the first one before. I don't know. I feel like I heard, I've heard it somewhere before. Like okay. Not okay. How do we get it? Show of hands. Yeah, so, all right. So, first one's AI. Show of hands. Okay, a few people. Okay. Second, Second one is AI. AI. Show of hands. Both of them are AI. Both of them. You know what? <laughs> Interesting. None of them are AI. None of them. Oh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so I will tell you the answer in just a moment. But regardless of the answer, this just goes to show that neural networks can do some pretty powerful things. And uh, this has made it uh, show that it's pretty difficult to tell which song is made by a human, which song is made by an AI. Um, so the first one was actually made by AI. The second one yeah. was made. Is the second no, the one? first one's a human. The second one's the AI. The first one was human. Yeah. I thought you swipped them. <laughs> no. I might have flipped them back. No, I flipped them back. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. That well, they were flipped on me. You see how difficult it is yes. to tell? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, we're going to learn some, uh, some things about neural networks, and neural networks were the backbone of this project. All right. Uh, so neural networks are pretty important because a lot of technologies you see today are using neural networks. Things like Tesla's self-driving cars, um, Google's Translate, uh, AlphaGo, if you're familiar with that program. All of these use different forms of neural networks, uh, and they are very powerful computational tools. 
so one of the great things about neural networks is they're pretty flexible. Um, there are small little tweaks and variations that we can make to neural networks, and they can do a vast uh, range of things. So like I just mentioned, we have something like Tesla's self-driving car, which takes in a lot of image data. It also takes in infrared data, and it has to trans translate all of that data into something that the computer can understand. And that would be one form of a neural network. On another end, we would have something like Google's text-to-speech, which is taking a lot of text data. And all of that text data also has to be translated into something that the computer can understand. And that would be another variation of the neural network. But by just changing some small little parts in the neural network, it can do a lot of different things. So a lot of people like to try to say that a neural network is based off of the brain. And this is very loosely analogous. There are some similarities that can be made. But in reality, neural networks are just a fancy way to do linear math. But most importantly, we have the universal approximation theorem, which is basically saying having our feed forward network and at least one finite hidden layer and enough data, our model can approximate a function to correlate inputs to outputs. So one of the ways that we can use uh, do this is with activation functions. And activation functions help us to take our inputs of any range of numbers and squish them down to zeros and ones. Uh, this is important because it helps us normalize our data, basically gives us a baseline and helps us judge um, where everything is. So this would be a very common uh, activation function. This is called the sigmoid function. And the sigmoid function's uh, numbers look like that. So this is the um, this is the math for the sigmoid function. And this is the function that takes any number and will squish it down in between 0 and 1. Uh, does anyone have any questions about the sigmoid function or activation functions? Oh, well, we're pretty clear so far. All right. So taking that activation function, we're going to go a little bit further on that. This is called a perceptron. A perceptron is our basic building block <laughs> of our neural network. So like I just said, people try to analogate a neural network to a brain. A perceptron would loosely be like a neuron in the brain. So this is taking a certain amount of inputs and then a bias, and then it is giving us an output based on those inputs. So taking a look at this, you can see on the left-hand side, we have our inputs A, B, and C. And those are all connected individually to the activation function with the weights, weights 1, 2, and 3. And then separately on top, it has a bias. Does anyone want to take a shot at why the bias might be separate? Yeah. All right, so the bias is separate because it's kind of like a slider for our activation. Our activation function, as the name implies, will activate the node. So given a certain um, threshold on the activation function, that node or neuron will fire. Uh, the bias kind of takes that and slides it left and right and says we want there to be a minimum or a maximum range where this neuron is going to fire. So it kind of helps us to have a threshold on our activation. The three things that I want you to remember about how the perceptron works, there's three steps that will be applied that you're going to see repeated throughout this process. We're going to take all of these inputs and the respective weights and we're going to do a dot product on them. And then we're going to add our bias and then we're going to activate it and get our output y. So this can be seen here. As I just said, we'll have our input a multiplied by its weight 1. And then that's going to be added with all of the other weights and their inputs. And then separately, the bias will be added on. And we're just going to put that in the variable x. And then does anyone want to take a guess at what that symbol is there? Yeah, so in different math classes and different statistics, they have different names for this. But in this context, this is going to be our sigmoid function. So that's the activation function that you just saw. So we took the dot product of everything. We took the bias. And then now we're using the activation sigmoid on it. And that gives us our y. So now I want to just take a look at a simple neural network here. You'll see that we have two inputs, two hidden nodes, and two outputs. Does anyone have any questions so far on this? All right. So basically, we're going to have our network set up so that we want it to give us an output of 0 on the top and 1 on the bottom. We're going to feed in some arbitrary inputs. 
and we're going to start with some arbitrary values for the weights. Everything at the beginning starts very arbitrarily because we don't know what are the best values for our neural network, so we just initially uh, randomize it. So we'll take these two weights and we're going to do that process that we were just doing a little bit earlier. We're going to apply the dot product from the inputs 0.4 and 0.6 and their respective weights 0.8 and 0.2 and then we're going to add on our bias there. And that's going to become our x for our hidden node 1. And we take that value and it gets activated in the sigmoid and that becomes 0.65. I saw a hand here. So initially, uh, the bias is random. All of, these are, uh, all of these values are arbitrary. And as we go through iterations, um, weights, biases, inputs will, or not inputs, but uh, weights, biases, and hidden nodes will all be changed throughout the iterations. And that will be covered a little bit later. Mm -hmm. So like you just saw, that was a process that we just used a little bit earlier of the dot product, the bias, and then the uh, activation function. And that will give us our first value for the hidden node there. So going forward, establish what the next hidden nodes process is going to look like. It's going to look very similar. So you'll notice here that this 0.4 and 0.6 stay the same because those were our inputs. But now we have two different numbers here. This 0.3 was a 0.8 in the other slide, and this 0.7 was a 0.2. Uh, these are representing the weights connecting these two nodes to the bottom node. So the reason they were different before was because there were separate weights connecting it to the top hidden node, and now these are different weights, again, connecting it to the bottom node. And every node will have different weights associated with it. And again, we just add on the bias there, and that becomes our x for h2, which is 0.94. Uh, again, we run that through the sigmoid, and it gets activated to 0.72. And that becomes our value for our next node. And again, we go through this process, feeding it forward all the way through the neural network. And we'll do our dot product. We'll add the bias. We'll activate it. And we'll store that node, or we'll store that value in the last node. One more time, it's getting a little repetitious. Dot product, add bias, activate. We get 0.82 for that value, and we'll store that on the bottom output. So looking at our model, did it do what we wanted it to do? Eh, it did not. So we wanted it to guess 0 and 1 for those values, and it did not. Looking back at it, it guessed 0.47 and 0.82, which you can see it's sort of on the right path, but not really. So now we're going to talk about how does it go back and how does it try to approximate, or how does it try to change values so that it can get a better approximation. Who all here is familiar with gradient, or at least has heard of the term before? I see a few hands. Does anyone want to try to stake, take a stab at what gradient descent is or explain it to the rest of the room? Nope, cold feet, that's fine. <laughs> all right. So. Looking here at this graph, this is our error function for one of our weights. You can see the left-hand side here, and this is our weight with respect to i and j. So this is a map of error function. I want you guys to take a close look at this dot right here. This is basically representing how much of an error do we have in our calculations. Now, we want this error to be as low as possible because that will be our model as correct as possible. And that's what we're aiming for as machine learning practitioners. So one way to get this is to get to a minimum. But how do we get to the minimum on the error function? Does anybody have any ideas of how we might be able to get to the minimum? <laughs> one more time. The derivative of it is finding where The derivative of? This. OK, that's a step in the right direction. So we are going to be taking derivatives. We're going to take a derivative, with respect, uh, derivative of the error with respect to the weight. Uh, this is going to give us our gradient, which is going to be that slope line right there. So when we're looking at this gradient, we're going to be looking, is it pointed in the positive direction or negative direction? If it's pointed in the positive direction, like this, that means that it is 
pointed away from a minimum, and we want to follow it in the negative direction. If it were to be on the other side pointed downwards, then it's pointed in the negative direction, and we want to follow that to a minimum. One of the ways that we can walk, walk down this uh, error function is with our learning rate. So a learning rate is going to be how much we get every iteration that we are tweaking our model. So it would look something like this. We'll be taking a small step. A learning rate can also be called a step function, which is why we're taking a step. So as we take steps towards this minimum, we're getting closer and closer. But if we accidentally make our learning rate too large, we might overshoot a minimum, which would be a problem. Now I want to ask, how do you know whether we are in a local minimum or a global minimum? That's the correct answer. You don't. So that's one of the issues, is we don't know when we are in a local minimum or a global minimum. Um, if we knew this, then we would have all of our models be 100% accurate, and that'd be great. But we are working on optimizing our model to get the lowest error possible. So I want to bring back our friend the sigmoid right here, our activation function, and remind you that this is what its formula looks like. But if we take the derivative of that formula, and that will also give us the gradient, or the slope that we just saw. And that is a very important piece that, you just, uh, that I just demonstrated. So that slope or gradient is going to be uh, playing a major role moving forward. Now, mathematicians like to use a lot of symbols for everything. So this can actually be rewritten as this, where, as I showed earlier, this is our symbol for sigmoid. And then we have our sigmoid derivative symbol there. Anybody have any questions moving forward? All right, so let's take a look again at our network and the errors that it made. And let's just focus on that top layer there, because focusing on two layers at the same time would get a little bit fuzzy with all the math. So for intuition, we're going to focus on that top part. So now we know that we wanted 0 for the output, but it gave us 0.47. So how do you think we could calculate our error? Derivatives are a good guess. Derivatives are used quite a bit. Uh, but in this sense, it's a very simple approach. We'll just take the value that we wanted, and we'll subtract the value that we actually got. And that's going to give us the error of our output. So in this case, the negative 0.47. We're just going to plot that number there. Later. We're going to be coming back to that number. And, it's going to be and just to remind you, those weights connecting those nodes are 0.8 and 0.1. And we'll be using those values in a little bit also. So if you look at this function, there's a lot going on there. Uh, but I want you to take a minute to just look at all of the numbers and symbols that are going on there and tell me what that looks like. It should seem very familiar to you. I think I see someone saying it. Yeah, it's the derivative. Yeah. Right, yeah. So that is the derivative of our sigmoid. So. In this case, that 0.24 is actually representing that gradient, that slope that we saw a little bit earlier. So this is going to be the gradient of our output there. Uh, we got that by taking the error of our output, that negative 0.47, and plugging it into our formula. So now just writing that number down. This is a formula. This is what we're going to be using to get the uh, delta of our weight, which we're going to use later so that we can change the weight and make uh, make changes to our model so that it better tries to approximate our uh, end result. So we're going to take that error of the output that we had, the negative 0.47. We're going to take the gradient of the output that we just calculated. And we're going to take the activation of the hidden node before those two. So this will result in all of that up there. That's going to be negative 0.072. And we're just going to write that number down on the bottom so that we remember it for later. Now we want to take the error of the hidden node. And this is a little bit different of the process than taking the error of the output. Um, but it should be pretty intuitive. So we're basically just going to take the error of the output and then multiplying it by the weight that is connecting that hidden node to the output. And the numbers, we're going to get negative 0.047 there. 
and we'll just write that number down temporarily in that node so that we have it for later. Now moving back even farther, who wants to take a shot at what the next step is going to be? That's correct. We're actually going to just keep moving backward and use the same process. We're going to find the gradient again with our values. Uh, this is going to give us our gradient yet again. And we're going to hold on to that value. And then that gradient is going to be now multiplied by the error of the hidden node and the activation of the input node. So that will result in our negative 0 0.0045. And we'll write that down just to remember it. So now we're going to use those two delta w's to calculate how much we're going to change those weights by so that our model can try to make a better guess at that output. That's going to be done with this formula here, where the weight sub n is going to be equal to the current weight that you have uh, plus that funky looking n, which is going to be our learning rate or the step that we were taking, and then multiplied by the delta w, which is those um, gradients for the weights that we calculated just a bit ago and wrote down. So plugging that in, we get point zero or yeah, zero point eight zero 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 four five and point one zero zero seven two. Does anyone want to take a guess at why these numbers change so minutely? A really small learning rate. Exactly, yeah. So we were taking very, very tiny steps down that error function. And so our numbers did not change that much. But this is going to be done over several hundred or maybe even 7,000 iterations. And as these iterations go through, you'll continue taking steps down that error function. And that will result in these numbers uh, minutely changing every time, hopefully towards a more correct answer. So that was backpropagation. And backpropagation is pretty much just the gradient descent that you saw earlier. Does anyone have any questions about those two processes, gradient descent or backpropagation? Does the intuition seem pretty clear there, though, of how we moved backwards? All right, great. So now I want to just talk a little bit more about some of these activation functions that we have. So oh, you saw me referring to the sigmoid a lot. The sigmoid is very common uh, in these types of models just because it helps us normalize things. It brings things in between 0 and 1, which can be very helpful. Um, but these, are, uh, these can be replaced by other activation functions in certain situations, which may lead to better results, uh, one of them being ReLU, which stands for Rectified Linear Unit. And in this activation function, it is taking the max of 0 and the input. So basically, any negative values uh, will be disregarded and not activated. Um, this is used a lot in hidden layers in, uh, in models in the real world. Um, we're not really sure why it works so great, but we do know it does work so great. So this is uh, a very common activation function to use in hidden layers. Another function that we do have is the softmax. And softmax is great for when you're trying to uh, label something, um, specifically only having one single label as opposed to multiple labels. This is because the softmax gives us a probability distribution. So when you're looking at all of those outputs, all of those outputs will sum to one, and all of them will have a probability. Uh, you can see why this is very important for classif classifying just one output. Um, as opposed to if you had multiple things that you wanted to label or classify, then maybe a probability distribution would not be your best idea. All right, does anybody have any questions? All right, well then here's some memes. <laughs> All right, so now in this next portion, we're going to hop into the code. Um, Jarvis is going to walk you through some neural networks on a Jupyter notebook. So if you have your laptops, you can follow along there. Um, I'm going to go over like, the notebook and stuff. I don't know how you do it. So. Do it. <laughs> <laughs>
Alrighty. Um, all right. So, um, so let's make sure everybody's good on the process of back propagation and how how a network actually learns and everything. So we get, we we got a, we're gonna have a lot of time to go through this workshop because we're gonna be introducing some new libraries and stuff. So we're gonna take some extra time to go through all this. But I just want to make sure we're all good on that. So feel free to ask. Um, all right. So I'm gonna show you just how to get the notebook up, and then we'll get started. Um, so let me. And this meme, as you can see, this is, um, we did a lot of math and stuff, but in the workshop you'll see, you'll just be like, import neural network, and then boom, it works. Not as simple as that, but a lot of the, all of the math and stuff is, is handled by the library. So, which makes, deep, making this stuff pretty simple, actually, just to make some basic models, just to see how they work. So, all right. Uh, also, feedback form. Um, I'm going to be preaching this a lot, so please, if, um, Give us your feedback uh, if you're going to be like leaving early and stuff before the end of the workshop. Go to this link, ucfai.org forward slash feedback, and just give us some feedback on how well uh, Dylan did and how well Jarvis will do. Hopefully, very well. But you know, we we want to we want to know if there, if there's anywhere we can improve, like this in our content or this in the presenting or anything like that, because that really helps us, you know, in future semesters to give uh, better and better uh, workshops. All right, so let's get out of this. Uh, hopefully the screen will be fixed at some point in the near future. <coughs> All right, so pull this up. And let me pull up. Yes. Um, yeah. All right, so. <laughs> All right, so I'm just going to walk through how to open up our workshop. So first, go to our website. It's going to be UCF. AI.org. Um, this will bring you to our main page of our website. Um, once you're here, we're just going to go to core. And then you'll see some information about our core group and stuff. Uh, we're, in, we're in a spring 2020 edition, so let's click that. <coughs> um, once we're here, we're just going to scroll down, and you'll see this meeting here, Introduction to Neural Networks. Um, right here. Uh, so the slides uh, will be posted and the YouTube video will be linked here when, you know, when, when all that stuff's up and available. So this will be updated with that. Um, we're going to open this up on Kaggle. So just click follow along on Kaggle. Oh, by the way, anyone that came in late uh, to sign in, can you please go to ucfai.org forward slash sign in so you can sign in for this meeting if you arrive late. Um, so here, let's click follow along. we will bring you right to our notebook. Yeah, what? Oh, no. oh. Hey, um, for the yeah. section of the uh, AI.com, uh, are there going to be the notebooks posted also? Yeah, everything will be posted there. Core is kind of the only thing that's up right now because we're still having issues, but we just needed to get core. If the video and stuff, um, yeah. it's all posted in the Discord. Oh, yeah. yeah, so on announcements, yeah. So all, all that stuff's up, like the video for supplementary and things like that, all that's up. If it's not up on the website, just go to the, and go to the announcements for that channel. It'll be posted there. Yeah. Yep. Um, all right, so oh, we're going to need to sign in this. All right, so then you just click copy and edit here, but I need to sign in real quick. Because um, um, if you don't have an account on Kaggle, create one now. You can log in with like, your Google account or something, but you need to. I need to sign in. Famous East Dillon's Google account. All right. All right. So let's let's do that. Uh, let me full screen this. Too. All right. So we're just going to click copy and edit up here, and then this will this click I understand and accept. <coughs> this is just for like the data mm -hmm. sources and stuff, and for the competition. Um, oh no, Dylan. Can you come activate your account? <laughs> this and Kaggle, yeah. We're going to be using GPUs now, starting to train our model. And so uh, do you have your account? This is your only Kaggle account, right? Yeah. Because uh, it'll disable your account. They disable, like they disable mine. So let's make sure. But yeah, you're just going to have to just confirm when you're just entering your phone number. Confirm. Yeah, so oh yeah, so yeah, take some time to do that now. Click copy and edit and open it. Because if you haven't verified, since we're using a GPU, you need to verify your account with your phone number. Uh, so make sure you do that now. Take a minute. No, <laughs> to eat everything. 
And make sure you don't use your phone, phone number on any other account because it'll just disable your account. That's a new thing now. Don't be like me and just have your account destroyed. So. Rip. Rip. <sighs> yeah. All right. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Wait, what is, what is this? I just did the thing. Yeah, the caggles. Caggle. Uh, you should get chicken instead. Yeah. We need more chicken. All right, so I'm just going to go through that process real quick again to get to the notebook if you, anyone missed it. So I'll go here, in 2020, scroll down, and networks of neural networks. Copy and edit. Okay. Once this, your notebook will come up. Uh, everybody's good. No, anybody have issues pulling up the notebook? Raise your hand. Good. All right, sweet. So let me just make sure that the DPU is on. Yep, DPU is <coughs> on. So we are good to go. Um, <coughs> let me just put it there. For uh, get this out of the way. Yes, thank you. There you go. Okay. All right. So should be good to go. Brilliant. Okay. So welcome. Yes, I'm doing this again. Third time for this charm, right? Hopefully. Okay. So we're just going to run this first little thing up here. This is just to make sure that we are on Kaggle. So this should run just a okay if you're running this. If you are running it locally, uh, just be aware that you could have some problems with this uh, notebook. You might have to refactor a little bit of the code to make sure that you load data and everything else properly. But with that being said, uh, we need to do some imports. Now, there's some things that you noticed before, right? So we saw, we have seen NumPy as well as Pandas before. Um, however, there's this new thing called Torch, right? Now, this is the library called PyTorch. It's going to be the deep learning um, framework that we're going to be using this semester to do all mo our model creation. There's a few different things we're going to be importing from Torch. So the obvious one is Torch. We need to import Torch to do Torch things, right? We're also going to be importing Torch.nn as NN. So this is going to allow us to make uh, neural network layers. We have uh, NN.functional as F, so F's in the chat. It's also for uh, functions, so activation functions. That's what we're going to be using F for. And then the data utils, we're going to be having a data set and data loader. I'll get a little more into that in a few. And then op Optim, so Optim, yes, good old Optim. Um, that's going to be our optimizer, so how we, how we make our network better. We're going to be talking a little more about that in a few. And then import time. And then torch summary, what that allows us to do is get a nice summary of our model before we train it so we know how many parameters in it and all the other fun stuff. So, let's run that. So, okay, come on. There we go. So, first things for, what do you want to do here? Okay, so yeah, you need to install Torch Summary. It doesn't come in uh, the Calc kernels off the bat. So, before we get into stuff, we're going to be looking for CUDA. So, does anyone know what CUDA is? Michelle Pants? We got one? Oh, we got all those people in the back. They, they don't count. Okay. Anyone else? Maybe? Does anyone have an NVIDIA GPU? Yeah? Well, if you have an NVIDIA GPU, you already have CUDA. So congratulations. Woo! Um, basically, what CUDA is, it allows us to speed up computations for calculating floating point calculations. And what that means is that when we do our deep learning training, we're able to run models extremely quickly. So even though we might have very big models with a lot of parameters we need to tune, we can still do it in a very quick t in a very short amount of time because we have very powerful hardware that can back us up. So we're going to check for CUDA right quick. And lo and behold, it is true, since we are running on the GPU um, Kaggle kernel. If you guys don't see this as true, you guys might need to modify your Kaggle notebook so you're in GPU mode. And we can have coordinators. If you haven't paused that, raise your hand. We'll have one of our coordinators help you out with that. Okay? So that being said, 
we are also get a set device. So, uh, device we're basically saying, okay, we want our training to be done either on our GPU or our CPU. So this little statement up here, you probably get to see this quite a bit. So if CUDA is available, we're going to be using the CUDA, and if it's not available, we're going to be using CPU. So this device should return CUDA, correct? Yeah. So we will be using CUDA for that. Yes. Does it not use them simultaneously? So you don't necessarily want to, because the thing is, when on your GPU, you have memory, and that memory access time can really slow down your model and you don't really get a lot of training speed out of your CPU. So to transfer data back and forth, you're actually going to be slowing down things more than if you just throw everything at the, C at the GPU. So that's a good question, but the CPU can be do other things while the GPU is training, and that's what we're going to be getting into with Data Lotus. So that's a good question. OK. So now that we have that out of the way, we're going to talk a little bit about tensors. Now, does anyone has taken a class about tensors? Any linear algebra people in here? Woo, okay, we got one. It's a back row, though. We don't count them. Is anyone else? Okay. So a way to think of a tensor, think of it as an, as an nth dimensional box of data, okay? And this box of data is basically what our neural networks are going to be using to train on. Um, they're very similar to the, N the NumPy arrays we've been using before, so extremely similar to those, and they can do a lot of the same things, right? So we can create a new tensor and get certain values, we can create an empty tensor, we can create a tensor with random values in it, we can create a tensor with just zeros, we can create a tensor with uniform numbers in it. We can do all these different things, right? And if we want to see what the tensor has in it, in the Jupyter Notebooks, all we have to say is new tensor, so the tensor that we declared earlier. So right here, our new tensor. And this will just show us our tensor. And look at that, a little data container. Isn't that beautiful? Now, here's a quick question for you guys. What type of data type do you think is these numbers in the tensor? Anyone? Uh, judging by the decimal point, if they're floating point. Floating point, yes. Yes, they are going to be floating points. So that's going to be very useful for later. There are, there are times where you might be using ints or binaries in networks. That's a little more of a fringe thing, but you can assume that when we're doing networks here in core, they're going to be floating point numbers. So either single, so 32-bit floats, or 64-bit floats. OK. So let's have a new tensor. And we can do some replacement, right? So say we want to change the value at, at 0, 0. So we want to change it from 1 we had up here to 5. We can do that very easily. So we say, OK, the value at this place and this place, make it a 5 instead of a 0, instead of a 1. And look at that. Easy enough, right? So replacement is very simple, very similar to arrays, basically. And we can also do this thing where we send our tensor to, to device. So what happens here? is that we are going to be saying, OK, we want to take our new tensor, and we want to send it to our GPU. Now, do you see how the device label has changed? So before, we didn't have that device label. Now it says CUDA. All that says is that now this, um, this tensor now lives on the GPU. So if we want to do training on this tensor, it's already loaded in memory. Boom, we can go. Very useful. You'll be doing quite a bit of th that later when we get into data loaders. And we can do a few other things. So we can get the type of the tensor. <laughs> we can get the shape, the size, and the dimension. So there we go. So yes, they are. It, so this tensor here is a CUDA float, right? So it's in CUDA, so it's a separate data type. It's going to be, we can get a size of it, and we also get dimension. Simple enough. And then, say you have some uh, values already loaded into a NumPy array. Loading it into a tensor is super, super easy. So we just get our little NumPy array. And then we say torch dot from NumPy, give it the array. And then look at that. Now it's a new tensor. Right? Easy enough. So that's the little overview of tensors. So with that being said, 
we are going to be going into making a basic little model right now. It's going to be very simple. It's going to train in no time at all. But we we'll kind of explain some of the nuances that you have to do to make a uh, PyTorch neural network. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say we're going to define how big we want our input layer, our hidden layer, and our output layer. And then we're also going to do this thing called batch, right? So we're going to have five, ten, so ten, five hidden, and one out. So batch size, I'm going to bring that down for you guys a little bit. What a batch size is, is basically you take, so you have this huge data set, right, of million parameters, of a million things, right? Do you want to send all that data at once at your network? Yes, no, maybe so? Who says yes? You want to send all of the data to the GPU all at once? Who says maybe we should break it up so we don't overload our uh, VRAM? Yep, that's what we need to do. So that's one thing we need to do. We need to break them into smaller chunks so our computer can handle it. Another cool thing you can do with batches is that when we go forward, we can collect all those errors at once, average them all out, and do back propped across back once instead of one time for every forward. So think about it this way. We, when we do our back propagation, we want to, upgrade, we want to uh, update the weights in a very efficient way. If we just did it from one forward pass, it may, have, may overfit a little bit to that first forward pass, but if we average it out with uh, a bigger batch size, we can say f for more of a certainty that the updated parameters are a little better, right? And also saves us a lot on GPU expenses because we can um, kind of limit the number of back props we do. Yeah, Mike? So hypothetically, if you had a GPU with infinite VRAM, would there be an advantage to like putting all of your data in once because you have the average of all of your data? So potentially, it might cause some speed ups with, um, with just training. Mm -hmm. And then you can also have very big models and not really worry about stuff. Um, like the most GPU RAM you can get right now is off of a Tesla. And those things have like 24 gigs of VRAM. But still, that's like not enough for some like large data sets. But yeah, yeah. There, there are data sets that go into like the hundreds of gigabytes, yeah. and that's like a data set. If you're talking about enterprise things, they don't have fixed data sets anymore. They do data pipelining, which is a whole other thing. That's DevOps. This is not DevOps class. I'm sorry. Um, but yes, um, you will have to break it up either way, just because hardware is limited. We don't have infinite RAM, which makes me sad, because I want, you know, I, I want to load everything in a RAM. I want to have a million Chrome tabs open at all time, but we got to make some compromises sometime. Yeah, just stick with two Chrome tabs, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. I already ate up my 64 gigs of RAM. It's terrible. Any other questions before we head on? I'll make it pretty clear about batch sizes, right? So, okay. So with that being said, we got to generate our data set here. Um, we are not actually going to be using a, um, a natural data set for this. This is just to be randomly generated numbers. So we're going to make some random numbers, and we're going to set some random y's, right? So we got our x here, they're just random whatever numbers. And then we got our y's there, which are just our random whatever numbers. So ooh, batch size is not defined. I did not run this, that's why. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. There we go. The error stopped it now. So right down here, this is where we define our model. So we're going to be using something called nn.sequential. So basically, one layer after the other. And we're going to say nn linear. So linear, another way to think about that, that's going to be our fully connected layer. Right? So again, we send this through our fully connected layer. And then we're going to apply the sigmoid to it. So a sigmoid activation function, send it through another fully connected layer, and then another sigmoid activation function. Okay? So fully connected layer, that was what we showed off earlier. So every input node has an equal number of connect is connected to every every node in the in the layer next to it, right? So everything's connected to everything else in the next layer. That that's not always true of some networks. Some networks kind of pick and choose what nodes they connect to, but with fully connected layers, everything's connected to everything. So we're going to define our model right quick. And now we want to define our 
loss function. Now we're going to be using something called uh, mean squared error. Does anyone remember mean squared error from linear regression? Yay, nay? So basically this is similar to the error we used in the presentation earlier. Only difference is that now the difference between our expected and our actual is going to be squared. So we square it and that causes that causes a little bit uh, different loss to happen. So if we are really wrong, we're, we have a really big loss. And if we're very close, we'll have a much smaller loss. Kind of helps with scaling our loss function here. And then obviously, it's already averaged down everything. So we're going to set that as our loss function here. And now we need to set our optimizer. So for our optimizer here, we're going to be using something called stochastic gradient descent. So that's what SGD is. That's going to be our standard. Uh, gradient descent model that we've used before. And these two parameters that we're going to be feeding into our loss function is A, the parameters of the model we've just defined. So that'll be model.parameters. So, hey, we say, okay, we're going to make this optimizer. These are the things we want you to optimize. And then the other thing we're going to define here is our learning rate. So that's the small number we want to update our weights by, right? So, and that's going to be 0 0.01. Small small update of the weights, right? So there we go. And now with that being done, we got to train our model. So first thing we're going to do here, we got to send our model to our device. So we're going to take our model, send it to the GPU. We're going to take our data, right? And we're going to send it to the GPU as well. And then we're going to do something called an epoch. Has anyone heard about epochs before? Yeah? We got one. We got another one. Oh, we got a few in the back too. Ooh. Okay. So, the way you think of an epoch, it's one full round of training on your whole data set. So, we have a relatively small data set here, but for our epoch, we're going to go through the whole data set one time. Okay? And we're going to do that 50 times. So, we're going to have 50, 50 rotations through our training data. So, first thing we're going to do is the forward pass. So we go through our network once. We're going to calculate our, our loss loss here, right? And we're going to print out our loss. So we're going to say, okay, in this epoch, we got this loss. We're going to zero the gradients in our model. Does anyone know why we want to zero out the gradients? So the gradients. Remember from the presentation, what did we do with the gradients? Anyone? It's a positive and negative, but more precisely when we're doing the optimization step, what do we use the gradients for? Well, find, find the error, but we, that's how we update our weights, right? We use the gradients to update our weights. So we don't want to have the old gradients there because that was from last time we need to have new, new gradients. So we're going to zero them out. So when we go through our back step again, we don't, we don't look at those old gradients. We just look at the new ones. So that's what we're doing when we're zeroing out the gradients. And then we do our backwards pass, right? And our backwards pass, that's going to be us updating, uh, basically finding out the error going backwards through our network. So all the nodes in, in the hidden layers, all the way back, we're going to find those errors. And then we're going to optimize. So we're going to find gradients, and then we're going to adjust the gradient, adjust the parameters according to the gradients. So let's see how quickly we can do this. Oh, look at that. It's already done. Woo! GPUs are great. Who likes GPUs? All your hands should be up. They're amazing. You guys aren't gamers. That's probably the reason why. Who's a gamer? OK, and you didn't have your hands up saying you love GPUs? Come on, man. All right. So now that we did that, we want to see whether or not this did well. Now, does anyone notice anything about this loss we have here? It hasn't really changed much. Yeah. Does anyone know why? We didn't run enough iterations. So we didn't run enough iterations. OK, that could be true. Learning rate's too low. Maybe the learning rate's too low. I'm looking for something about the data, though. What was the data we fed into it? Oh, completely random. Yeah, it was random, right? 
Are we gonna learn anything from random data? No. No? Who says we're gonna learn stuff from random data? Who says we're not gonna learn stuff from random data? Oh my god, look at oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, so lo and behold, random data we can't learn stuff from randomness. Though our next little data set here is not completely random. So the diabetes data set, it basically this was a kind of competition from a few years back. And they want to see if they can use deep learning to help with uh, diagnostics of diabetes. So with that being said, we're going to get our data, and we're going to throw this into a pandas uh, data set. And we're going to look at the head. So what do we see here? Does so anyone want to say something about this data? Okay, so what do you guys think the outcome is? What, do they have diabetes in it? Yes! So the outcome is good to, is basically our label, right? So if it's a zero, no diabetes. If it's a one, diabetes, right? Simple enough. Now we have all these other parameters here, and that's going to be our x's. So we have a number of pregnancies. So, you know, that could be a risk factor for diabetes. Glucose level. So... Does anyone know anything about diabetes? How it's? Oh yes. Anyone else? Yeah. Well, glucose absorption. <laughs> yes. Yes. So the glucose absorption. So if you have elevated glucose levels, it's not a very good sign. You're probably on the either pre-diabetic or diabetic already, right? So that, that's probably going to be a very important factor here. Blood pressure. So there's a whole bunch of bad things that happen with high blood pressure. One of them possibly is going to be diabetes. We're going to find that out. Then skin thickness. So basically, when you pinch your skin, how thick is it? Also, it could be a risk factor for diabetes. Insulin level. Yes? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, possibly. Um, if we really want to see if this was going to help us determine if someone has diabetes, what we could do is we can take that parameter out and then send it through our model and see if it makes the model better or worse. Because if it made it worse, then obviously it's probably important. And if it made it better taking it out, then it probably wasn't useful. We can probably discard it. But that's something we still need to look at. Then we have insulin, so insulin level, and then BMI, so that's basically body mass index, you know, the mass of a person. It's another way to think about it. And then diabetes pedigree f uh, factor. I'm to give a shot about what that is. Anyone? Yeah, medical history <coughs> of diabetes in the family. Okay, yeah, so maybe the genetic mm -hmm. factor, right? So whether or not you are genetically disposed to having diabetes or not. So yeah, that's our data. And let's get some information about our data. So non-null objects, right? OK, so we need to do something to this data set, right? This first level here, we should get rid of it because it just floats, right? Well, these are labels. We don't really need labels when we feed into our data into a model, right? Yeah, we can probably get rid of them. So let's get rid of them. That's what we're going to do here. And then when we do our info again, look at that, they're all floats. Do we want floats for our network? Yes, we do want floats. So there we go. <coughs> and right here, we're going to be checking for uh, non value. So basically, we're going to be checking whether or not these things are null. And it looks like we don't have any nulls here. So that's good, right? No null values are good? Yes. So this data set is clean, looks like it's going to be good for predicting diabetes, and we have no nulls. Our data set's clean, let's go uh, define our model. And, well, before we do that, we need to do a test range split. Oh well, so first here we're going to be breaking it up into x and y. Then we are going to uh, expand the dimension. And then we're going to do our test range split. And there we go. 
So PyTorch has a unique, uh, some unique functionality in it that allows us to do data science a little more efficiently. One of them is called a data set. So what this is allows us to do is get small batches of our data as we train our model, which allows us to train our model a little more efficiently, efficiently right? So the data set is basically like, here's all the data we need to use to train. We're going to be training a little more efficiently if we use our data set. So that's what we're going to define up here. And then we're going to take our trained and test data. We're going to put them into data sets. And then we're going to put these data sets into a, um, a dictionary. So either it's going to be a, a train in a training set or in our validation set. So that's what we're doing here. Now data loaders. Now remember what I was saying earlier about the data loaders? How we want to feed in our data in little chunks so we don't overwrite. Uh, GPUs, right? Agreed? So, how much VRAM does your computer have at home? Eight. Eight? Of course you do. <laughs> it's in your lap right now, mate. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. He, he's flexing. It's whatever. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. So, my old GPU had about six, and that was like cutting edge when I got it. So, you probably have around six or eight. So, we want to give it little chunks. So our data loader here is the way we give it little chunks. So we're going to define our batch size, and that's going to be 16. So we're going to give it 16 bits of data at once. We're going to shuffle the data. So when we shuffle the data, what are we going to do with that? Anyone? Maybe someone? You had a hand up, right? Oh, wait. Okay. <laughs> Alright, so essentially, um, <coughs> if you're feeding batches of data into this like sequentially, mm -hmm. I don't think you'd want to feed the same set of data like before, because then you just get like, the same outcome, essentially. Mm -hmm. So it just learns how to predict that data. Exactly. Yeah. So you don't want it to memorize the set. I guess this would be a way to prevent overfitting, per se. Yeah. No, it does help with overfitting. So we want to shuffle data so doesn't overfit and just remember the order of the data it gets. That would be bad. Number of workers. <coughs> um, basically, these are the number of threads we're going to be running to load data in. So the number of CPU cores we use it at any one time to load data into our GPU. So that's what I was saying earlier about having the set different things to do with our GPU than our GPU. We're going to be using our CPU to feed data into our model. And so that's our data loader. OK. Now, when we define a model in PyTorch, we generally define it as, a, um, as an object, right? So when we initialize an object, we're going to initialize the layers we have in it. So this model here is going to have two layers. right? We have a first fully connected layer and a second fully connected layers. <coughs> and then. When we, um, when we go through our data, this is the forward is what, what we do in our forward pass. So what we're going to do is first we're going to send it through our first full connected layer, apply our ReLU function to it, we're going to send it through our second fully connected layer, and then we're going to apply sigmoid. And then we're going to return it. So that's our model, very simple, not very big. Now. What we're going to do down here is we're going to define the number of uh, input size, number of hidden layers, number of classes. So there's only one class, right? So either yes to diabetes or no to diabetes. That's the only thing we're trying to predict here. The number of epochs we're going to train for, and our learning rate. OK? So we're going to find our model right here, <coughs> define our loss function. Define our optimizer. We're going to be using Atom here. So Atom is the way to think about Atom it is a variation on uh, stochastic gradient descent. It's a little more optimized for training, and we see better results from Atom usually. So if you ever see Atom, just think gradient descent with extra flair to it. And we're going to send all this stuff to our device, right? So we're going to send our model 
to our GPU so it's there so we can start training. And then we're going to get a summary of our model. So there you go. <coughs> so this is this is a printout of our model. So we can see our we can see the number of parameters we have in here, the amount of parameters we can train, and all that good stuff. And we can also see the size, right? So right down here, we have the size of our model. This is how much space we're going to take up in the GPU. Is that kind of tiny? Right? Yeah, that's tiny. We're not going to worry about, worry about GPU RAM this day. So down here, we have a function that defines running one epoch. So we're going to split this up into the uh, test or train. And what we're going to do for the for everything in our data loader, we're going to send um, our inputs and layers to the model. We're going to zero our gradients. We're going to do the fill pass. We're going to calculate loss. And then if we are in the training stage, we are going to calculate, we're going to go backwards to find our gradients. And then we're going to do the optimizer step. So does anyone know why we only want to do that during the training step? Anyone? <coughs> so possibly we don't want to fit data to our validation set. Remember, the whole reason why we do the test training split is so we can test whether or not our data is training properly. So we don't want to train on validation data because then our validation data becomes non-valid, right? So we want to keep a set a strict separation between the two. And then we're going to get our, um, <coughs> our running loss and, and corrects. And we're going to send these back to our, um, to our function. So basically, we're going to take our loss for this epoch and our accuracy for this epoch, and we're going to send it back to our training loop. That's what this is. So we're going to start the time here. This is so we can see how long it takes to train it. And I'm going to say the best model is the current model and the best accuracy is zero. This is just printing out some headers. And then we're going to train for the number of epochs. So we do the first training run, which is going to be training. We're going to get the training loss and accuracy. You're going to run the validation step. And then right here, we, well, okay, before we do that, we need to print out the loss and for both the validation and the training set so we can see some numbers as we go. And then if we have a better validation accuracy than before, we are going to save the model. So does anyone know why we want to do this? <coughs> anyone? So basically the reason why we're doing this right here is so that we can basically keep the best model we got. So if we have the best validation score, we would say that's the best model we've had so far. Yeah, yeah right. So we're gonna save the best model. And then after it well done, we're gonna stop the timer. That's gonna be the total time we've trained. Get print out some little fun stuff. And then we are gonna return <coughs> um, the best model we've had. So the best model we had, we're going to say, OK, this is the best thing we had. We're going to return it. Here's, here's the best we got. So let's make sure we ran both of these. And now let's train. You guys ready? Ready for this? We've, we've been waiting all night for this. Ready? Woo! Yeah. So while that's going, let's look at the, tr at the test. <coughs> this is similar to before, but we're only going to be using um, we're only going to be using our, um, our validation set when we're doing the test. We're not going to do back prop or anything else. This is only to tell us whether or not we did we did good for our test. Okay, right? That wasn't too bad. <coughs> so. Let's do our test. Now, who remembers Matthew's coefficient? Anyone? Yeah. Yes? OK. Wait. <laughs> so, OK, here's a little refresher about Matthew's. You, you want to give it? Or? 
Okay, fair enough. So if we have a negative one, it is perfect non-prediction, right? So every time we expected zig, we got zag. One, every time we expected zig, we got zig. And every time we expected zag, we got zag. So the closer we are to one, the better the model is. So, is this model good? Yes? So that's only 0.818. <coughs> Do you guys think that's a good model? Eh, maybe not. Okay, let's check the confusion matrix. So this function right here, it's just going to give us our confusion matrix, but it's going to make it a little prettier. So let's see what we got. <laughs> uh, one way to look at a confusion matrix is that everything across this line is accurate. So it was a correct prediction. And then everything in these boxes here, that's going to be a wrong prediction. Has anyone noticed something about this? Which box is the wrong prediction? <coughs> so this box and this box could be the wrong predictions. These are correct predictions. Well, we got quite a few bad predictions, right? We can we can say that. Yeah. Okay. So now here's the fun thing we have to do tonight. Who wants to make a better model? Yay! Yes, everyone should make want to make a better model. So what we need to do is we've basically set up everything you need to train this model right back here. All right, so let's look at this model. Actually, let's go down to summary. So, what's a few things you think we can do to make this model better? Anyone? So, I'm gonna give you guys a few hints. This model is very simple, right? So we only have 151 parameters to it. So we can possibly make a bigger hidden layer or add more layers to our model. Another thing we can possibly do, see how we only train for 20 epochs? Could we possibly train for more epochs? Yeah. So the general rule of thumb doesn't hold all the time, but more training the better. So you might want to increase the number of epochs. Now also this learning rate. Is this learning rate low or kind of high? Anyone? Well, fun fact, it's a little high. <laughs> so we can probably lower our learning rate well as well, right? So we have these parameters we need to play around with. We can really change our input size or our output size because that's dictated by a data set. But everything else about this model, we can change. We can change the activation functions. We can add layers. We can change this from sigmoid to maybe uh, softmax. And so we knew a whole bunch of stuff here. <coughs> That's what y'all could be doing for the rest of the, rest of the evening here. Our coordinators will be going around to help you guys out. So if you have any questions, we're going to be sneaking around here, hopefully. So yeah. Any more questions at all? Or? No? All right. All right, so for submitting, um, once you have your notebook done, you're going to click Commit up here. So yeah. this is going to basically run through your entire notebook again and save like a final draft version, cop like copy of your notebook. Um, so it'll, this should only take a few seconds to run, but it's going to run through all your code. So your model and stuff and everything will run. And then at there's some code at the bottom, that will generate a submission file for you to submit to the competition. Um, basically, it just saves your results for a test data set that you don't know the answers to. And then you submit to the competition to see how well you did. Uh, so this is still running, so let's give this a second. You guys like the, the workshop and the lecture tonight? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Right. Um, we have office hours, by the way, too, so we've been pretty lonely, so please come and ask questions. Um, you know, that's available Monday, Tuesdays, when, uh, Thursdays and Fridays. So there's one hour on one of those days throughout, like, different periods of the day. So, And our feedback form, too. All right, so let's open up this version. So once you're done, you click Open Version. Now this is your final complete copy of your notebook. So down here, you're going to click Output. 
There's a handy dandy little button that says submit the competition. And this will submit. And then you can see how you compare to other people. So we submitted. So let's see the leaderboard and see how we did. All right. So Dylan, you got 67%. Uh, this person that I don't know, I think this is some random person from somewhere in the world who did this. So they're able to get 75%. So you got to beat this random person somewhere in the world. Uh, there's also this guy from India that submitted to. So I don't know why. I don't know how he found this, but he did. So he submitted to. Uh, but yeah, see if you can. So we got 75% is our highest score so far. So let's see if we can get higher. You guys can get higher. Let's go, guys.